morning, this morning, the gospel of love. The gospel is about love. It's the gospel of love. It's good news. In Romans 5, 8, we have up there, says, But God demonstrated his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the more that I dig into this uh, issue of the God kind of love, the more I'm discovering that religion has really perverted the gospel, perverted the good news, and I'm just going to get this out of the way now. I guarantee you things I'm going to say this morning, I'm really going to tweak you. I mean, your head's going to be like banging on the inside. And your first reaction is going to be to reject what I'm going to say. I'll just tell you right off. So, I'm asking you to push through that. Listen. Let's, let's take the scriptures together that we're going to do, and we're going to talk about that, because really, religion has really perverted the gospel, the true gospel, what God intended from the beginning. So, I was one of the, let me say it this way. Let me give you an example. How many of us have been taught how to evangelize? How to lead someone to Christ. Have you ever gone to a class on how to lead someone to Christ, right? You sit you down, and they go through this process. Usually, what I got taught in Bible college was what they call Romans Road. You know, so when you start to talk to somebody, the first thing you usually do is what? You share the love of God with them. You tell them John 3.16, you know, God loves you. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. So you share, well, you know, would you like everlasting life? Or however you were taught, you, you begin that conversation, tell them God loves you. And then what usually happens, you immediately jump over to Romans, because now you've been taught Romans Road. You get your little plan. You've got to go right along, step one, two, and three. So then the next thing is you go over to Romans 3.10 and tell them that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You know, immediately you go from telling them God loves them to telling them you're a stinking sinner. You know, and there's none righteous, no, not one. And the wages of sin is death. And man, because you're a sinner, you're going to die. And death means you're going to be separated from God for all eternity. So you went from something positive to something pretty negative, and then you got to try to spin it back a little bit. So then you bring them over here. But you know what? God still loves you. Because God demonstrated his love towards you. Even though you were a sinner, Christ died for you. Christ became sin for you and took his place on the cross. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that good news? Jesus died for you. That's what we tell them. That's good news. You know, and they're still sitting there reeling. What's this guy talking about? And then you go over to Romans, you know, 10, 9 through 13, and you start telling them, well, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved, you know. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Would you like to go to heaven when you die? Now, who's going to say no to that? Really? Even a drunk will say, yeah. I mean, come on. Who's going to say, you really want to go to hell? You know, your sin separated you. It's heaven or hell. Your choice. Which one do you want? I mean, come on. Say, would you like to go? No one's going to say no. I'd say, well, if you just pray and ask God to come into your life, he'll save you. And then they'll say, well, I'm not sure how to pray. I've never prayed, never been to church. Say, oh, I'll pray for you. You just, you just repeat after me, right? And we got this memorized prayer that we give them. So we pray a couple words, they pray a couple words. We pray a couple words, they cover. And as soon as we're done, what happens? We get all excited. Oh, man, now you're saved. Now you're born again. You're going to heaven. You don't have to worry about, you know, going to hell. Everything's great. Isn't that awesome? And we get more excited than they do. They're still sitting there wondering what just happened. And then we start telling them, oh man, now you need to go to church. Now you need to grow in this faith. Now you need to get all this stuff. So, you know what? How about you come to church with me Sunday? We got a great church. You really love our church. And, and I'll even come by and pick you up. And, and we do all that and, 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 and to get them in. You know? And you know what happened? That's what we've been told it's the gospel. The gospel has been turned into a prayer to get people to go to heaven. And we've been turned into the salesmen of that prayer. Because you know what? We come in Sunday, don't we? We get this guy that we just wonder, Lord, we come in and we're strutting. And man, we think it's, we're the greatest thing. 
And we're all pumped up. I want a soul. Man, you're going telling everybody. And hey, let's get them up front. Let's have them confess. Everything. Let them tell the whole story. And we're sitting there all excited. Man, I'm a great soul winner. It's all about winning souls. This whole thing that Jesus came and died for was winning souls. And we go on and on and on. And then what happens? Just think about it a minute. What did we just turn the gospel into? Think about the presentation we just gave. The first thing that we put on this person about the gospel is God's going to judge you if you don't get born again. You're going to go to hell. It's about the judgment of God. You know what? We might even, if they ask us some questions, take them over there to Revelations 20 or 21. I forget it. I ain't been there so long and I'm glad. But we go over there to the great white throne judgment. Say, oh, look at everybody's going to stand before God. And the books are going to be open. And the book of life is going to be open. And whoever's name was not found in that Lamb's book of life is going to be cast into the lake of fire and burn forever and ever. You don't want to burn forever and ever, do you? No. You want your name in that book, right? Yeah. Who's going to say no to that stuff? It's just like when Peter was in the boat, right? And Jesus was walking on the water. Remember? Yeah. And Peter said... Lord, is that you? Bid me to come. What could Jesus say? <laughs> it's not me. Right. <laughs> Stay in the boat. Peter just said, if it's you, tell me to come. The only thing Jesus could say was come. When we say to someone, you know, you want, you want to burn in hell forever, don't you want your name in the book of life? What are they going to say? The only thing they can say is, yeah. But that's what we turn the gospel into, the judgment of God. And how did we... we project that judgment of God came from fear, didn't it? We use fear to motivate them. You don't want to go to hell. This is a fair judgment, burning for all eternity, paying for your sins for all eternity. So when we present them a fear-based, judgmental type of gospel, a lot of people have heard it that way, haven't they? That's kind of the way Romans Road presents it, doesn't it? But we sprinkle a little love in there. Just, you know, God loves you, you know. Yeah. But if you don't accept that love, you're going to burn. It'll turn to burn. <laughs> you know? But then also, think about it. What did we just make the gospel also? We just made the gospel all about them. It's all about you. God loves you. You're a sinner. What else do we tell them? You need a Savior. You need to say this prayer. You need to come to my church. You need to grow in the faith. You need to become a disciple. You, 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 everything's about you. And then if we get real good, because we're Pentecostal, we go, hey, it, it gets good. You know, God's got some awesome benefits for you. You know, we go, go over there, Psalms 103, forget not all his benefits. You know, God's got these awesome benefits. He'll heal you. He'll prosper you. He'll do all this stuff for you. And we just made the entire focus of the gospel on me. So God is, even though we say he's a God of love, no, he's a God of judgment. We motivate by fear. Doesn't that sound like the world today? Everything you hear on the news is motivated by fear. Don't follow that one, because if you go there, you'll get that. Follow me, but I'm not that. Everything's about fear. You know? Flu season's coming. Get your vaccinations now. I just saw a thing on the commercial, a commercial about they, the New Hampshire, whoever it is, CDC or whatever, everybody six months old, get that flu vaccination. Why? You don't want to get the flu. Fear. It's fear-based. It, it, everything in life is generated around fear-based, so we do the same thing when we present the gospel. We motivate people. You can motivate people by fear, can't you? You can, get, you can scare people into going the way you want them to go. Well, we do the same thing with the gospel. And it's sad. And, and look at what I'm doing right now. I'm not mocking this, and I'm not, definitely not judging the motive behind the people that do this, and they're sincere about it. People sincerely want to see people go to heaven, amen? amen. I want to see people go to heaven. I don't want to see anyone go to hell. You know, so there's sincerity behind that. But what I'm discovering is that is in Bible. Someone developed an evangelistic plan, so they took this verse out and put it here. This verse, I'll put it there. And here's your little plan. Here's your little step. Romans Road to lead them from hell into heaven. 
And religions turn the gospel into steps on how to go to heaven when you die. And preaching the gospel has all become about soul winning. That's what it was for me. That's why I was taught. That was the group I was brought up in every Sunday morning. And the church I went to was an evangelistic message about soul winning. Every morning there was an altar call to be born again. And when people came, we were trained to lead them through Romans Road to get them to say a prayer and then tell them they're all set and they're going to heaven when they die. That's what church was. Every Sunday. I know. I was one of the guys up front doing it. I know. But people who come to Christ that way, just think about it, all right? Just, I know that was a little heavy right there. Just chill. Take a deep breath. Okay, because, yeah, that's where we've all been. But now just think about it a minute. People who come to Christ in that manner I just described usually live a life of continual frustration and many failures, don't they? We all probably can name people that have fallen from grace. There's people I knelt at the altar with, prayed a prayer with them, don't even go to church no more. They want nothing to do with Christianity anymore. Constant struggles, constant battles in their life. Some have completely turned their back and want nothing to do with Christianity anymore. Do you think, just think about this, do you think that was God's intent behind His redemption plan for man? Do you think that was His intent? No. To constantly struggle, to have constant frustrations, failures, falling from grace. Because we can look back and say, what happened to Joe? What happened to Bill? What happened to, you know, to this couple? All of a sudden, you know, their whole life blew apart. Is this Christianity, really? you got to struggle, and you got to fight, and you got to endure. Was that God's plan? You know, I think the issue might be, maybe we don't understand the gospel. And maybe... We don't intend understand God's intent for man at the original creation when he created man. That's why I think it's important to understand the gospel. We need to go back to the beginning and understand God's intent and why he created man in the first place. Because we know God's plan is never going to be thwarted, right? When God sets something in motion, no man can stop his plan. So that's what we've been talking about. Going back to the beginning. Remember, why did God make man in the first place? It wasn't because he was lonely and needed a friend. Okay? That's what we've been told. God wanted to fellowship with man. No. He had the Holy Spirit and Jesus to hang out with. He wasn't lacking fellowship. Right? Why did he do it? He made man for a particular purpose. Remember? This is real important, guys. We've got to get this. We can't just zone out. Because this is what I would do. If I was sitting there before listening to me, I'd zone out. I've got a guy made that big deal with it. Move on, okay? Give me something. Tell me about my faith. How do I get healing? How do I get prospect? No, no, no. Tell me about who? Me. That's an issue right there. We're going to kind of get to a little bit down the road. All right. Can I just tell you right now, again, like I've said already, God didn't create you for you. That wasn't his intent. His purpose was he wanted a visible representation of who he was here on earth. He created man. The body of man is a visible image of God. Why? He ain't got a body. He's spirit. You want a visible image. You know what a self-portrait is? It's a visible image of you. Or someone makes a statue of you or whatever. It's a visible image, a representation of you. That's what God wanted. He said, let us make man in our image. He wanted to make a self-portrait, so to speak, of himself here on earth. For what? To shine. Remember, I want a visible image here on earth. So the big question comes, man's always wrestle with purpose, ain't they? Man always wonders, why am I here? What's my purpose in life? Know what your purpose in life is. Let's just address it now. We get it. And the next time someone says it to you, you can tell them. we got to go back to the beginning. Why did God make man? Know what your purpose is. Your purpose is to be a visible image and representation of that, of his likeness. And what is his likeness we learned last week? Love. Right? His nature. 
That's the flow out in love. God is love. That's the foundation of everything. So man's purpose is to be that visible image and demonstrate, ain't that what he did? Demonstrated love. That's your purpose. That's it. Easy. So we want to understand that. And not only that, he created man with a destiny. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. What am I supposed to do? Why am I here? What am I supposed to do? Man has wondered that forever. And we've come up with all this stuff. Know why you're here? To be a visible representation and demonstration of his nature. That's why we're here. So, what's my destiny? God created man originally for what purpose? To procreate, recreate himself in that same image and nature that he put upon him. He blessed man and said, go, fill the earth, right? So what God didn't just want was two people in the garden living in bliss. Well, get ahead of myself. Sorry about that. In order for God to do that, he had to create a woman. Because he looked and saw a man was alone. How is he going to fulfill his destiny without someone to be destined with? And that was awesome. I was thinking about this this morning. God did not make woman out of another lump of clay, did he? He didn't pick up the dust of the ground. He did that once. Dust of the ground, breathed into it life, and it was man. So how did he make the woman? He knocked man out. Good move. That might have hurt really bad if he didn't knock him out. <laughs> Took out a big hunk of his side and made woman. Now think of it a minute. What did he do? He made one to then make two so they could come together and make one. That's awesome. I'm like, that's like wicked cool. So woman is no different than man. Women proceeded from man. Same value, same identity, same makeup, same purpose, same destiny, same everything. He didn't change something for a woman. Because a woman came out of man. For the same purpose and same destiny. So we get to get out of this thing that man made women different. He didn't. See, when God looks, he sees the same. He didn't see a woman and doesn't see a man. We do that. He sees one. He only made one in his image, in his likeness. And then he made another one from the same one. So that the two could come together and make another one. And what do you say? Keep doing that. That's what I want you to do. That's your destiny. You keep doing that and fill the entire earth. Not just to hang out in the garden and have a blast. Not just to have fun. Whatever. It wasn't about that. He was to reproduce himself and fill the entire earth with his image. This is important because we've got to understand God's plan. Because next slide, if you would, Jesse. Because we know what happened next. Right? Over in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 17. We know man fell, right? So what's it say? Look at up there. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. So it said, God took man and put him in the garden of Eden, attend it and keep it. And then the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Right? You're going to die, Adam. Well, we know he didn't die physically, right? Because Adam lived to be 930 years old. He didn't die physically. And what I thought was interesting, up there when you look at it, in the day that you surely die, in the day that you eat of it, was he prophesying? He knew he'd eat it, wouldn't he? In the day you eat it, or it could be, if there comes a day that you eat it, you're going to die. Or God was telling him, in that day that you do eat it, you're going to die. But you know what? The choice was always Adam's. Because God made man a free moral agent to make his own choices and own decisions. So God said you're going to die. The question now becomes what died? See, what we've been taught happened to Adam. I don't know about you, but there's always been all these various answers, and I just put some down. It's, it's God, Adam died spiritually. Okay, that's one of the common things we heard. 
Stop a minute. And let me ask you a question. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> it's a great answer, and then we go with that, right? Lost fellowship and communion with God. But did he? God still hung out with him. God still talked with him. God still had the prophets. God still spoke. God sent angels. So we go on. He lost his communication and fellowship. He became the son of the devil, as it says over, I forget where, John 7, somewhere in there. You have your father the devil, Jesus said. You know, he became eternally separated from God in need of a Savior. That's what tell people when we bring them down Romans Road. See, Adam died spiritually and became in need of a Savior because he lost his connection with God. And, you know. And when I began to think about it, what does all this mean? Why, when it says, Adam, in the day you eat of it, you'll surely die, we come up with 15 things that describe what that meant. I don't think God did that. I think God knew what he meant when he said you're going to die. I don't think 15 things are going to happen when you die. But that's just the way we come to try to understand what happened. And it's really simple. Because next slide, if you would, Jesse. Just let's go to the scripture. It's real easy. It's the same. Genesis 5, 1 through 3. I'll read it. It says, In the book of the genealogy of Adam, in the day God created man, he created him in his likeness, created a male and female, and blessed them, and called them mankind in the day he created them. Okay? So they were mankind. He created them, he made them, how? An image and likeness, right? Adam lived to be 130 years old and begot a son. So because of this, the way this is phrased and the, what, the event we saw in the garden, we already know he's fallen right now, right? Can we kind of assume that pretty, you know, I don't think we got to stretch real far to say at this point when he had his first child, he was now fallen. He'd already sinned. Okay? Said, and begot a son how? What's that say? In his image. His own image. After his own likeness. So I think it's pretty clear. What died in Adam was the likeness in divine nature of God. Because when he had a son, how was that son reproduced? It didn't say God's image and likeness. In Adam's image and likeness. So what died? That image and likeness. It's not, it looks like Adam. Follow me. And see, I've been thinking about this, and, and I want to chew on it some more. I'm just going to kind of throw it out there. Maybe you can chew on it too. I think we're still in the image of God. I think we look pretty similar to the original creation. So the image is still the same. But I think it's pretty marred. Pretty messed up. It's like a self-portrait where the artist wasn't the greatest. And then this came to my mind this morning. Look at Jesus after he was all done at the whipping post. When he was carrying the cross, hanging on the cross, he didn't look anything like him, like he was originally. You could see he was still a human being, but his image was so marred, so removed from what God wanted him to be, what God created Jesus to be. And I think it's the same with us. Even though we have a similar image, I think we are so far from where he originally would have been. Definitely the likeness is gone. The nature of God. That's for sure. That's why I just want us to kind of hold on on that. For sure, what died? He said, on that day you surely die. No will die in you. My likeness. My nature. So when Adam died, also the original purpose and destiny for man, what God created him to be and what man had for him, what God had for him died. Adam lost his source. Love. Love died that day he sinned. That he took of the fruit. He lost his source. His source gave him his identity, his purpose, and his destiny. His divine nature was then passed on to all men. 
Next slide, if you would. I really want us to try to get this because this is huge. This is really where the rubber meets the road in this whole message. Right here. Because what have we been told about Adam? Adam died and he sinned. And what happened? His sin has been passed on to all men for all of sinners, right? So man has sin nature. But what does the scripture say? Does man have a sin nature? When fallen man fell, I'm not talking about redeemed man. Look at man. Follow the progress. God's original design. Purpose. To reflect his image and likeness. Destiny. To fill the earth with his image and likeness. How are we going to do that? He took man and made him. Took from man a woman. Made her. One became two to become one to fill the earth. Okay? Keep that. you got to keep that. If you don't understand why God set it up in the first place, if you're not on track, you can get diverted very easily, right? I don't think we ever go back to the beginning to understand what was the purpose of man in the first place. Because God's original design has never changed. We've gotten off track. What's he saying here in Romans 5.12? I got it up there? Awesome. I'm sorry, I just forget what slides I made. That's all. It says, therefore, just as one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. Now if you were taught Romans Road, you might use this verse too and say, look it, you know, all have sinned. Because death spread to all people. See, all have sinned, and that spread to you. That's why if you are born in the line of Adam, you're a sinner. You get the sin nature. That separated you from God. But wait a minute. God said when you eat of this fruit, you're going to die. What died? Nature died. Okay? Now follow this through. Let's look at it in a second. It says, therefore, just as one man, through one man... We know the one man's Adam, right? You got that. Adam, it said, sin entered into the world. You gotta do this when you read your Bible. Stop it and ask questions. How did sin enter into the world? What's it say? What how what happened? Sin entered into the world how? Through Adam, what did he do? He disobeyed, right? God said. God didn't really say don't eat it. He said you can eat of every tree, but if you eat of that one, you're going to die. We turned it around and said don't eat that one. That's okay. It's not messing it up. Don't eat of that one because when you do, you're going to die. So what did Adam choose to do? Eat of that one. Okay? So he disobeyed what God told. Okay? So through disobedience, we could say sin entered into the world, right? So that's it. One man, Adam, he disobeyed. So what happened? Sin entered into the world. And then what's it say happened next? Death through sin. So what does sin produce? Death. Okay? James 1.15 clearly states that. It says, then when desire has conceived, we can take the same analogy and put it in disobedience. When our ungodly desires, we go through with them, they conceive, it says it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Okay? So let's get the order. We get disobedience, right? Which brought forth sin, right? Which brought forth death. Okay, got the order. Disobedience, sin, death. What's the next part of the verse say? And thus death spread to all men. Why do we say sin spread to all men? Why do we do that? You're a sinner. Well, you're judging me. What are you calling me a sinner for? Well, Adam sinned. You get the same sin nature Adam got. It spread from man to man to man. Why do we say that? Where'd that come from? Because all have sinned. You know why? Because all have sinned. But what did the progression say? When you had the desire, it conceived what? Sin. And when sin was fully grown, what did it bring? Yeah. Ooh, I'm loving watching your faces like I'm, I'm watching the wheels churn. 
So I'm not trying to destroy things. I'm trying to get a true biblical understanding of what happened. Because I'm tired of leading people to Christ, watching them struggle, watching them fall out, want, watching them want nothing to do with God as the years go on. Something ain't right. And the something ain't right certainly isn't God, nor His plan of redemption. So I'm just taking a critical look at, look at, if we have, if God is love and He's got a gospel of love, then I need to go back and look at the original intent and follow it through. That's all I'm doing, right? That's all we need to do to really get to the truth of the gospel. Because we know the end result. God wants us back. He sent His Son to redeem man. But what happened to man in the first place? It said death got spread to all men. Why? Because all sin. Why? When sin is fully conceived, it brings death. Why have we been focusing on the sin? Sin wasn't the problem. God said, you will surely die. Sin ain't the issue. Death is the issue. God didn't say, in the day you eat of it, you will surely sin. You're going to get a sin nature. I'm going to have to judge you. He didn't say that. Right? Or am I misreading it? On the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Death will occur. Right? Let's flesh it through a little bit more. You might want to turn to Romans 5, because that's the only verse I put up. Romans 5, verse 13 says this. For until the law... Sin was in the world. This is huge. Oh man, I'm going to start shouting now when I saw this the other day. Hmm. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. I'll tell you what, until really until like Friday when I was going over this, I did not understand this portion of scripture at all. Because I was of the mindset, like I'm trying to tell you now, well, it's about sin and sin nature. We're talking about death and sin. And what? I always put death and sin together. I gelled them together. It meant the same thing. It doesn't mean the same thing. He says, until the law, sin was in the world. So when Adam... All right, let's look at the second part first. But sin is not imputed where there is no law. What does imputed mean? means put upon, right? Imputed, given to. So, when there's no law, sin can't be imputed. Imparted to the other person. They can't be judged for it. You know, if you're going down, if they had no speed limit signs between my house and here, I could go as fast as I wanted on Route 4, and no cop could stop me because there's no law. Right? No law. I can drive whatever I want. What God was saying was, then there was no law. You can't get a ticket. You can't be judged. Sin was not judged. Wait a minute, brother. Well, look at this. Right after Adam had Seth, he had two more kids, didn't he? And what happened between them two boys? One wasn't real happy with the other. To the place, what did Cain do to Abel? He killed Abel. He killed him, that right? Later. He killed him. What happened to Cain? God put a mark on Cain's forehead and said, anyone mess with this boy, you got to deal with me. Wait a minute. He killed his brother. <laughs> Last I knew murder was a sin. When I was a Catholic, it was a big one. You know, it wasn't one of them venial ones or car. It was a big one. A mortal sin. You didn't mess with that one. God, what are you doing? Why was Cain not judged? He just told you right here. Sin was not imputed because it wasn't a body. You know what? Look at verse 14. Let's 14 say in chapter 5. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. What? Draws a distinction right there. Who was the lawgiver? Moses. Moses. Once Moses showed 
showed up, what did you start seeing happening in the Bible? Judgment. Why? Now there was a law. Now you had to follow the law or you would be judged. What happened from Adam to Moses? There was no law. There was no judgment. But what still reigned? Death. What got passed on from Adam to his boys to all the other generations? Was it sin? No, there was no law to pass on. Death. Just kind of clicking now. Death reigned. And it says, even those who did not sin according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. There was stuff going on, but sin wasn't imputed. And then verse 17 says this, For if by one man's offense death reigned, not sin, not the sin nature, but by one man's offense, Adam, death reigned, said through one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. And you know in Romans 5, it's kind of given a contrast, right? So that's what that's talking about. But again, through one man's offense, death reigned. Sin wasn't passed on. Death was passed on. God said you're going to die. What died is nature. His image got really messed up, but I think it's still there a little bit. But the thing that definitely died is likeness. Nature. 1 Corinthians 15, we always read this at funerals, don't we? 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57. So when the corruptible puts on incorruptible and the model puts on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, death is swallowed up in victory. Didn't say sin was swallowed up in victory. Death was swallowed up in victory. It says, oh death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, it says. Sin wasn't death. It's the sting of death. Because once sin comes to fullness, it brings forth death. Just like those allergic to bees. You get stung. That didn't kill you. But when the venom becomes fullness, you're in trouble. What the sting? It says, and the strength of sin is the law. Why? Wasn't imputed, wasn't judged until the law showed up. But then verse 57, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when Adam ate from the tree, the nature of God died within him. He was cut off from his source of love Love died. And as a result, get this, as a result, man became a God unto himself. This is where self became the purpose for man. This is where self-gratification became the destiny of man. Right there. Now let me read this to you in all different colors. So I really wanted to word it right said, man was designed by God to have a nature of love and to express that nature of love outwardly. When Adam died, that source of love, divine nature, died. The result was man could no longer feel the love of God placed inside of him. So he turned to all kinds of external means to regain that feeling of internal love that died. Because man was designed to express love. When the source of love died, his expression of love turned inward. He became a god unto himself. Thus life became about self. Man's focus revolved around what made him happy, what made him satisfied, what made him fulfilled. That's what happened. Do we see that today? We see that in Christianity today. Oh, I don't like them guys over there, so I'm going over here. Man, 
The thing that happened, because we've been lied to, man's become a god unto himself, and we make everything about self, and when everything's about self, we're not walking in the love of God. See, we want to understand, and I'm going to do this more next week because I want to kind of walk us through. Next week I'm going to ask you, why did Jesus die? Know why you've been told? We all can spit it out, can't we, for the forgiveness of sins? No, we didn't. So, chew on that one. Told you, you look at tweet. You're like, that man's nuts, I ain't ever coming back now. <laughs> You know what I want to do? I honestly want to preach the gospel. And I'm starting to realize the gospel I had before wasn't the gospel. Because the gospel isn't about winning souls and getting people into heaven. It's about God restoring back to man the original purpose and destiny he placed in him in the first place. That's the gospel. And we've got to understand what happened in that process if we're going to fully understand the truth of the gospel. When man died, the nature of God died. See, people wig out when they say, when, when he, us Pentecostals say, we got God on the inside. Same power. We can do all this. That's God's restoration. That's what he gave Adam in the first place. Same power. Same everything. God lived in Adam. Man, you're stretching it, preacher. No. When he made that clay, how did it come alive? Breathed, breathed. breathed into a what? The breath of life. Breath. I forget the Greek word. Fumor, I think. What's the Holy Spirit called? Breath. Over in John chapter 20, when Jesus rose from the dead, and that night, I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I don't care. <laughs> Is this making sense to you? You getting it? You getting excited? Because I'm like busting. When Jesus met with his disciples that night, what did he say to them? Receive the Holy Spirit. And what did he do? Breathe. Breathe on them. Why? He restored the original creation just like the Father did initially. He restored man back to his original state. And he did it the same act. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. We've got to understand the Holy Spirit in power. He's a person. He is love. And he wants to be manifested through us. The Holy Spirit is the likeness of God. Put back into man. Because what did it say in the first place? Verse 2 of Genesis 2. Man, the Spirit's good because i got none of this. He's just kind of like giving it to me now. This is like cool. What did it say? Have it over the earth. Spirit. So I guess what he breathed into him was that Holy Spirit. Right? Mm -hmm. See how it all fits? How it all gels? It's not like I wonder this. Why is this first thing? Why is it? Why did Jesus breathe on him? Why did he say he received the Holy Spirit? When did man get saved? We go through all this stuff because the carnal mind can't understand the things of God. But if we go back to the beginning and understand the original intent and design, understand what happened when man fell and what God said would happen, you died, then we can better understand how to walk out this process and preach the true gospel. God ain't about judging sin. He's about restoring man back to his original state, which was his image and his love to procreate here on the earth. And not necessarily in a physical sense anymore. He said, I ain't doing that no more. But we do that in a spiritual sense, amen? Because why? Let your light, love, so shine before men that they may see your, what? <coughs> Good works, and you what? Say, ooh, he's a great anointed preacher. Oh, he's got that gift of healing. I better run after him when I'm sick. No, it ain't about you. That they may glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Why? Because you're looking like Him, and you're acting like Him. Because it's all about Him. See, man was never designed to function without a source. As God's unto ourself, a self-centered man will always flounder around in this world, trying to live in a way that he was never designed to live, looking for love in all the wrong places. Now what I'm saying is, I'm not saying people ain't saved. 
So people are saved out of fear of being judged, thinking because they said a prayer they're going to heaven. They probably are. They probably receive Christ. But you, people do not understand the whole intent of the gospel is to restore you back to the original creation. I was never told that. So what do we do? What does Paul say here in Galatians 5, 19-21 says this. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, can you do that? Yeah. We got memory. We have influences. The devil's out there trying to lead us through fear. So we can do this. What he's saying is, don't be born again and do this. The results are very clear. Sexual immorality. How many Christians are involved in sexual immorality? Good, night alive. It says impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostilities, quarreling. How many believers are quarreling with one another? Fighting, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, divisions. How many people are out causing divisions in the church? In life. Envy drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. How many people struggle with that? We've gone and set up Christian self-help groups now to help people deal with this stuff. He says, let me tell you again. This is a sobering point he makes. Let me tell you again. It goes on. As I had before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. You live that sort of life, you don't inherit the kingdom of God. Now we've turned that into going to heaven when we die. I've, I've not dug into it that deep. But know what? The other implication I put on this, which is very true, we know that. Where is the kingdom of God today? In us. You won't inherit the kingdom of God. You will not walk in the image and likeness of God yeah. with this. Why? Man wants his cake and eat it too. You will not reflect the nature and image of God here. How many people are struggling trying to remove these behaviors from their life with no success? How many struggle? Let me give... Throw up the next slide if you would. Let me give you a takeaway. You know why we're struggling? We're struggling because of this. Take the order again. That's why I gave it to you. This is important. Disobedience. Are you disobeying in sexual perversion? All this stuff that I just read, right? Is that disobedience? So we can put that there. Disobedience leads to what? Sin. Which leads to what? Death. What's the thing we need to deal with? People are always trying to deal with the sin. Right? Let's get this out of my life. I don't want to be drunk no more. I need help. I don't want to act this way. I don't want to help parts of anger. I need help. God, help me. You're trying to deal with the middle issue. Not understanding the end issue has been taken care of. If death has been resolved, and death was what was passed on to all men... Is sin an issue anymore? No. Disobedience an issue anymore? No. What's the issue? Death. That's the issue. That's what we got to get back to with the gospel. The thing that doesn't need to get dealt with is sin. Sin is irrelevant. I just tweaked you. Sin is irrelevant. The problem with man isn't sin. The problem with man is death. What does death mean? Cut off from the source. Trying to function as a God unto yourself to fulfill desires. You know why? The inward love is dead. So you've got to do external means to feel love. You've got to just be able to sit there right now, focus on God, and feel this incredible incredible feeling of love. And a lot of people can't do that. Because they've not heard this. I'm not saying there's something wrong with them. I'm saying, until you understand what I'm sharing with you, you need to get back to the source. Doesn't it say that in Revelation somewhere? The Ephesian church, I think it was? 
You've loved your first love? Back to your first love? I don't think love was there by accident. You got it up there? Yeah. This is the gospel in a nutshell. This is out of the New Life version, only because I like the way it kind of explains it better. Mark 8, 43, 34 to 38. Jesus called the people and his followers to him. That's important right there. This ain't just for the followers. See, we made this for the followers. We made this for the super disciples. We made these for those that are really committed to Christ. You know, you do this, you're like, you're, man, you're in. You're like, you're like a super saint. No, no, no. He called everyone around and his followers. This is for everybody. He goes on and says, if anyone wants to be my follower, you want to be a follower of Jesus? I hope so. Do you want to be a follower of his? He says, he must give up himself and his own desires. Stop trying to live life the way you were not designed to live. You were never designed to be your own God, to fulfill your own self desires and gratifications and needs. He says, he must take up his cross and follow me. He says, if anyone wants to keep his own life safe. That's huge. You want to keep your own life safe? So many people are doing that. You know what a God unto themselves is? It's self-centered. i got to stay safe. Can't let these folk get too close. I can't put myself out there too far. I'm going to get hurt. You know the game. If you want to keep yourself safe, you'll lose your life. You'll lose it. If anyone gives up his life because of me and because of the good news, he will save it. He put him in the good news in there together. If you give up your life, or other versions will say, if you deny yourself for me and the gospel, you'll save it. It says, for he, but what does it what does a man have if he gets all the world and loses his own soul? And what can a man give to buy back his soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words among sinful people this day, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his shining greatness, his Father and his holy angels. That's the gospel. We've turned the gospel into prayer to go to heaven, and we've turned it into all the goodies and benefits we can get, We've still walked around self-centered. We as the definer of truth. We as the definer of faith. We as the definer of everything. Fulfilling selfish desires and needs and wants. But we try to die to self. We've got to understand. And I want you to think about this. Why did Jesus come? He didn't come to forgive sins. Sin was not Adam's problem. Because on the day you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Death was Adam's problem, not sin. Because disobedience births sin, and sin, when it's fully conceived, births death. The sinner is still focused on self. Everything at the beginning, disobedience and sin, is all about self. How many people say that? i got to get free from this. I'm in bondage. Man, I struggle with this. Man, my body hurts. Why can't I be healed? I remember been saying to someone recently, what if you never get healed and you have to go through the rest of your life feeling pain? What do you care? That's awful hard and uncompassionate. No. All you're focused on is self. The gospel ain't about self. You weren't created for self. God didn't make you for you in the garden so you could play and have a lot of fun. It was a little kindergarten. And he gave you a woman so you could have a lot of fun, guys. It wasn't about that. He made man to be the visible image and likeness of himself. And he made woman 
so he could fulfill the destiny of procreation, but not only that, for someone to demonstrate the love of God to. You know why? I'll just say this and end with this. There's no young here. You know why people go in relationships, they, they zoom. Never enjoy the journey. Go right from, hi, my name is Jim, to sleep together. You know why? People are looking for love. Because they know that's missing. And you know what? That external act sleeping together will produce an inner feeling, doesn't it? Feels pretty good, doesn't it? And what? Because man has lost his source. Because man does not understand. And even born again people, they got to look for an outside source to fill that void, not understanding what they got on the inside. Because you can feel love by just thinking about somebody. You ain't got to touch them. You know why? The connection is never supposed to be physical in the first place. The connection is spirit to spirit, the same spirit in me and in you is made of love. That's why I can love you. I don't love you because of what you do for me. I can love you irregardless. Because as we're going to continue to go through this and we go through 1 Corinthians 13, love takes no offense. You can't hurt me if I'm walking in love. But see, that's what we make it. If, how, man, I struggle. No. Death. Death was swallowed up in victory. I am now free. I'm not free from sin. I'm free from death. And if I'm free from death, sin's irrelevant. Everything before it is irrelevant. I am free from death because I walk in victory because of Jesus Christ. I don't even think about sin. <clears throat> I don't have to worry about sin. I don't have to try not to get angry. I don't have to try not to do all those things. Now, there is a process in that of first understanding. That's what I'm trying to convey to you this morning. And then breaking those habits and reminding yourself when you flare up, say, no, I'm not dead anymore. I get the divine nature of love in me. I can feel love for that person. Yeah, but what they did. No, no, no. That's the way that seems right unto a man. You've been humanly trained in the wrong school, remember? Humanly trained in the wrong school that says an eye for an eye. If you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to... Why do you allow another human being to determine who you are and how you feel? When we say, he's our all in all. He's our everything. No, he ain't. The person who can put your buttons is your everything. How many people have quit a job because they couldn't stand their boss? Since when did the boss become the Lord of your life? Jesus is still Lord of your life, regardless of what boss you got. You lost your purpose. It ain't about you. You ought to go in before that boss and be the light and good works that he may see your heavenly Father so that he can also rejoice and become born again. Not because you got him to say a prayer. Because he sees the original purpose and design in you. He says, I can love that. I see God in that. There is no God in a prayer that's judgment and fear-based. And all about them. Make sense? I'm going to quit because I have to keep going. <laughs> but please, take this. Watch it again. Listen to it again. Chew on it. Go over the scriptures. Because unless we have the solid foundation of understanding, we're going to continue to watch people flounder. We're going to continue to watch people struggle. We're going to continue to flounder and struggle. You've got to know who your source is. God recreated you to be loved. And if you need to go over 1 Corinthians 13 again and understand what love is, it doesn't take offense. It doesn't seek its own. When you walk in love, you lack nothing. So why did Jesus come to die? We'll get into that next week. Amen? Father, we thank you and love you. Worship you. Honor you. 
Lord, I thank you. Your plans can never be thwarted. We know that. Your original design for creation will be fulfilled. And Lord, we've made a mess of it because we've never understood the gospel. We never even understood the original design because all we've ever been told is sin, sinner, sin nature, judgment, fear. And Lord, this morning I pray by your spirit we have ears to hear and all that stuff gets broke off because death has been swallowed up in victory. And death, where is your sting? It's gone. Because once death was conquered, sin was defeated, and disobedience is irrelevant. Because now I understand my purpose. My purpose is not self. It's not about me, and what I think, and what I feel, and my desires. It's about your purpose, Lord, that I be the visible image and likeness shining in this world of darkness that people will see your good works working through the Holy Spirit in me that you become glorified. Because, Father, it's all about you. That's how you set it up. So you could sit and look down upon your kids and see your image, and see your likeness multiply, see them walking in the joy, and the excitement, and the fullness of that love fully expressed amongst one another. Father, help us. I don't know how. But Lord, just with it, initially now with this understanding of what the truth really is. The gospel ain't about saying a prayer to get our name in a book of life. It is about you bringing restoration back onto the earth. Lord, we thank you and worship you and honor you. And we walk out of here with a new purpose, a new vision, a new understanding of why we're here. We're not here to win people, per se. We're not here to point out sin. We're not here to help people struggle and get through struggles. No, we're here to proclaim that there is no more sting of death. Death is defeated, and we can walk in victory because you have restored back to us that original nature. Lord, it still boggles my mind that you wanted to inhabit these bodies of flesh. Mm -hmm. But you do. And you don't do it for us. You do it for you. And as we do it for you per se, we get the benefits of doing it with you. Having all things. You've given us all things. to pertain to life and godliness. So Lord, as we go from this place, May your spirit continue to work on us. We continue to chew on this. And Lord, we be that true light of love that this world is so desperately looking for. And we make sure we always point people to you. Because it ain't us. If they, if they get excited about us, Lord, may we remember it's because we're reflecting you. Father, we honor you. I worship you. Praise you. Lift up your holy name. For you are the one and true God. We praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be blessed. Enjoy.